I could see the hatred in their eyes as I walked across the hall to the podium. I felt my flesh being torn from my body, shot, stabbed, and probably hung out to dry before I even got there. I've had tears come to my eyes for the last five days, and at this point, I didn't care at all what they thought anymore. As I stood there, I could feel beads of sweat running down my back, my stomach was one huge knot, and no matter how many times I wiped my hands, they remained damp and sticky. Someone must have turned off the microphone because my words sounded almost like a whisper. The flick of the black switch on the microphone changed the situation. After glancing around the crowd once more, I pulled five neatly folded pieces of paper from my inside jacket pocket and began. And I think most of you know me, and you're probably wondering what the hell I'm doing here today. Truth be told, I'm not sure myself, but Reverend Thomas asked me to say a few words today. Two people in about the fourth row shook their heads, stood up, and walked out while everyone looked at them. If anyone else wants to leave, please do so now, so I can finish what I'm about to say without further interference. I heard a few people mutter something to themselves, but no one else left. I think everyone, including my family, was wondering what I was going to say next. I had been thinking about it since yesterday, and although I told Reverend Thomas the first would, I only wrote two sentences at the bottom of the last piece of paper. I would like to read the letter I received a couple of days ago, and would appreciate it if you would let me finish without interruptions. I pulled out my reading glasses and put them on. Normally, I didn't need them, but my eyes were tired, and I didn't want to make a mistake. Taking a deep breath, I began. Dear John, if you're reading this, it means I finally got the courage to do what I should have done months ago. I know you've heard my words a thousand times before, but I'm sorry. I know that doesn't excuse what I did, it's just that it's pretty much all I have left. If it were possible, I'd go back and redo everything I did, and we'd go back to being the happy couple we once were. But that's never going to happen, is it? Remember our third date when I told you that I was going to be your wife and that you no longer had to wait? You laughed, I laughed, and you said we should probably start planning our wedding. And a month later, we did just that. God, I loved you. Every time I thought of you, I got this warm feeling inside, and I couldn't wait to be in your arms again. When I said love that day, I said it with all my heart and with all my soul. We would be together until death do us part. I truly believe that, and I still do. Those first few years were better than I could have imagined. Other than being at work, I don't think we were ever within arm's length of each other. We laughed when people said we needed to get a room or when they said they were sick of our lovey-dovey talk. But it wasn't pretend, we just loved each other a lot. At least we did. When I told you I was pregnant, I thought you were going to burst into tears. When you finally stopped kissing me and swooning over me, we just looked at each other and knew what was coming next. When we spent the next 12 hours in bed, I thought we could never get closer, but I was wrong. When Philip was born, it was the second happiest day of my life. He was so beautiful, and we became the family I had always dreamed of. And I guess to this day, I still don't understand what happened. All I remember is that Philip started turning blue, and I was screaming for someone to help me. I tried to follow them as the nurse carried him away, but they wouldn't let me. I screamed and screamed until finally, someone gave me an injection. John, I didn't do anything wrong, you have to believe that. One minute I was breastfeeding him, the next he was turning blue. I don't remember much after that until I woke up and saw you next to my bed. And from the look on your face, I guess you knew what had happened. God, you were brave. You tried to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders, and I guess I never thought about how much you were hurting. The only thing I could think about was that my baby was gone. I cursed God, you, and everyone else who tried to come near me. I never meant to attack you, I just didn't know what to do. I was in so much pain. I was going to kill whoever said I could always have another. I didn't want another, I wanted Philip. He wasn't a puppy or a kitten that you could go to the store and replace. He lived inside of me for nine months, he was my baby, and when he died a part of me died. Like I said, John, I didn't even think about what you must have gone through. I must have driven the first wedge in our relationship. Even though you were an angel, I still snapped at you repeatedly, 
especially when you suggested I talk to someone. I remember swearing at you that night, telling you that I didn't need anyone to tell me Philip was dead. I already knew that. When I got back to work, everyone was friendly, but no one knew what to say. None of the staff had ever lost a child, so they couldn't imagine how I felt. My boss, Jim, made sure I was always busy, so at least I didn't have to spend all day at work thinking about how I felt. It seemed like after a couple of weeks, everyone except Kathy and Beth started to stay away from me. I could hear them calling me names under their breath, and at first, I didn't like it, but soon I didn't care. You saw it, why didn't I? Maybe I did, but I just didn't want to believe it. John, he was my boss for heaven's sake, I couldn't imagine what he had planned for me. We'd been talking, he'd ask how I was doing, and I thought he was genuinely interested in how I was doing. Sometimes we talked for hours about how I was feeling, and I never once realized he was driving another wedge between us. When he said you should have been more responsive to my needs, I believed him. When I told him that I resented you, he said he completely understood and supported me, unlike you. When we started going out to lunch, and you found out, you got upset. I told you that nothing was going on and that you had no reason to be jealous of Jim. I think those two corporate dinners I didn't tell you about were just the tip of the iceberg. I thought Jim was a close friend, and you saw him as a predator. He apologized over and over again after he kissed me the first time. He simply said he felt so close to me that it was almost a natural reaction. I told him not to worry about it, and when I touched his hand, he realized it was only a matter of time. John, if I had known what he was up to, I would have quit my job in a heartbeat. I only thought of him as a good friend, not as a lover. You were my only lover, but it seems that even in that respect, I had sidelined you. That when you told me we hadn't made love in three months, I called you a liar. I didn't know how long it had been, but it couldn't have been that long. I'm sure I hurt you deeply when I yelled at you and told you that I needed more time to mourn my child before trying to have another. I'm sorry for those hurtful words I said to you, I didn't mean any of them. I think it was a combination of anger and frustration from not knowing what to do that made me say those things. I'm really sorry about that. Like I said, I've probably said those words a thousand times over the past few months. I'm not sure who told you about the company dinner we had that night. I took a change of clothes to work with me so I wouldn't have to go home and change. I don't know why I didn't let you know about it. You were invited. I just felt I needed an evening away from you, even though we already had too many. Jim made sure my glass was never empty, and while I could tell it was because of the alcohol, it wasn't. It had been a long time since we'd been together, and when Jim danced with me, I could feel his touch on my leg. God knows I never knew he had booked a hotel room. I was very drunk when we went upstairs. If I had known you were looking for me downstairs, I would never have gone upstairs with him, much less let him do what he did. I guess my good friend snitched on me, and together with the hotel manager, you entered the room. I can't even imagine what was going through your mind at that moment, but the look in your eyes said it all. Now I wish you would have at least screamed or yelled at me but apparently, you were too surprised and hurt. You left before I could explain, and what was there to explain? When I finally got home, every word you said to me was like a sharp stone cutting into my flesh, ripping it open, and blood rushing out. When you asked me why, all I could do was cry. You never said, I told you so. You just threw another handful of salt into each wound and watched me scream. And then when you left the next morning, I thought I was going to die. Friday, I never showed up for work or even called in. I spent the entire weekend in bed, feeling sorry for myself and trying to find a way out of the situation. I couldn't lie to you, you saw everything with your own eyes, but I thought maybe you would forgive me this time. But you didn't. I guess I've been chasing you away from me all these months, and you have no more forgiveness left. When you wouldn't talk to me, I sent for mom. Mom could fix anything, but that when she saw me, she just shook her head and said she was sorry. If she was sorry, what was it to me? Two weeks later, I got my papers, but I didn't care anymore. I don't know where I put them, but it didn't matter anymore. I had lost you. For the next two months, you didn't answer my calls or emails, 
and even though I was working, I was of little use. The day I found out I was pregnant was the worst day of my life. I knew it wasn't yours, and the thought of carrying Jim's illegitimate child made me nauseous for days. My mom took me to the doctor, and he told me that I had to take better care of myself because I was going to be a mother. I got sick right in his office. I understand your lawyer got a huge settlement from Jim and the company I worked for when it all came to light. We were both fired and banned from using them as references. Jim was angry and blamed me for everything. When I told him I was pregnant, he laughed and asked how many other guys I had dated. John, at that moment, I needed you more than I had ever needed anyone else in my entire life. You were my knight in shining armor, you were supposed to take care of me, you were supposed to save me. I tried to call you so many times, but you never answered. I guess I wasn't expecting it. You were done, and I was done too. John, I love you more than I love myself, and I prayed to God every day that you would find it in your heart to forgive me. Yesterday, I stood outside your workplace, I just wanted to see your smiling face one more time. God, I love you so much, and it hurts me so much to think that I threw it all away. So the only thing I can say is that I will always love you, and that maybe one day you will find it in your heart to forgive me. I hope that in time you will find someone who will give you that beautiful smile back, and that you will remember from time to time what we had. I know I'm babbling, but I don't know how to end this because I don't want it to end. But I guess it is over now. My sweet and loving husband, always remember that I will always cherish what we had, and even if you are not with me, you will always be in my heart. Always, your wife, Ashley. I finally looked up and took off my glasses. How I read the last page, I can't tell you, because it, along with everything else, was soaked in my tears. I looked around, and the hatred that was there before was gone, replaced by sadness. I looked at the coffin beneath me and openly cried. Walking down the steps, I walked over to the open casket, bent down, and kissed my wife. I put the wedding ring on her finger that she had sent me with the letter and placed the letter on the pad next to her. If she was lost, what was I to do now? I wanted it back. Honey, please wake up, all is forgiven. Baby, let's go home. I missed you so much, I whispered to her, but she didn't answer. I felt a small hand on my shoulder. It was her mom's hand. Through her tears, she told me that she had always loved me and would live on in me. My dad helped me back to my seat, and I watched as they closed the casket in my life. I don't want to live with you, I can't live without you. I sobbed as I watched the casket being taken to the back of the church. I never made it to the cemetery. I buried our son, and his mother rested next to him, the two people who meant more to me than anything else in the world, were now gone. Dad drove me home. I hadn't been there in months, it looked lived in, everything was cluttered, but there was no food in the house. I went upstairs, lay down on what used to be our bed, and covered my face with a pillow. When I closed my eyes, it felt like she was right next to me, and I inhaled her essence from the pillow. In the room, there was a pile of crumpled sheets of paper on the floor. After reading a few, I realized that they must be the first drafts of her letter. I walked around and finally passed out on my old chair in the living room. In the morning, I noticed the newspaper clipping her mother must have dropped off a few days earlier. 29-year-old Ashley Moore was killed in an accident that occurred at 11.30 a.m. Tuesday morning. The car went over a railing on Cliff Road and ended up in a ravine 150 feet below. Her death was pronounced at the scene. Police say the cause was likely due to excessive speed, and her death has been ruled an accident. It was not an accident, and Ashley did not die as a result of the accident, she died months before she got in the car that day, and it was partly my fault. Why didn't I love her enough to forgive her and start over? That question has plagued me for the past five days, and I still don't have an answer. Jim's wife divorced him and took everything he had. He lost his job, his wife, and everything he owned, but he is still sucking air and still walking around free. I sold our house as is. I never went back there, and her mom donated everything in it to a needy family, a church. I bought a condo near my parents' house and have tried to keep an eye on them. Work keeps me busy, and everyone stops by to tell me how sorry he or she is for my loss. 
Ashley was right, no matter how many times you say it, it doesn't make it any easier. A man was beaten to death outside a bar on the north side, the radio news anchor reported. They described how he was beaten so badly he was unrecognizable. They had to use what was left of his teeth to identify the body. I turned off the television. Old news, I said to myself as I sipped another cold one. Ashley's mother was right, she lived in my heart, but it wasn't the same anymore.